Hi there, this is Victoria, and today we are talking through some general things to keep in mind when it comes to improvising with elementary students. Improvisation is one of the best ways we have to get an idea of how students are working through musical material. And that's because in improvisation, students have to draw on previous knowledge to generate new material. And on top of that, the generation of new material has to happen in the moment. It's spontaneous. So this synthesis of drawing on old information to spontaneously create something new is pretty impressive. Now, there are a lot of improvisation activities that your students are going to find valuable. They range from pretty free, open-ended activities like just messing around on a xylophone to more structured improvisation practices like a high school jazz ensemble improvising over the blues scale. Today, these guidelines we're talking about are going to apply to structured improvisation. That means that you as the teacher are in charge of putting parameters around the form you want the improvisation to take. Those exact parameters are going to depend on your students, on your teaching style, and on your unique educational goals. Let's talk first about some prerequisites for improvisation. Improvisation is an aural skill, which means that students are going to need a lot of experience and understanding about a musical element before they're asked to use it in an improvisation. So this kind of experience has to do with singing and playing and speaking and moving and reading and writing and making other musical choices. So in essence, all of the other things that you've been doing in your classroom can ultimately lead to improvisation, to the generation of new musical material. I talked to teachers recently about some reasons they don't include improvisation in their classrooms, and one of the reasons is that they're just afraid of the student response. They're afraid of it flopping. And from what I have seen and in my experience, one of the main reasons improvisation activities sometimes don't go to plan is that students don't have enough of an aural framework before they're asked to improvise. So here are two important prerequisites that you can think about. The first one is audiation. So when we are improvising, we are making musical guesses about what is going to sound good given the musical context. So for this to work, students need to have internalized a tonal and a rhythmic and a structural landscape based on all of the music that they listen to outside of your music class. If they can audiate, if they can um, anticipate, make musical guesses, if they can interhere, uh, all of these things around the term audiation are going to help students be successful. And then the second thing to keep in mind in terms of prerequisites has to do specifically with vocal improvisation. Just mechanically, vocal improvisation is different than instrumental improvisation because of the process that it takes to generate the sound. Vocal improvisation, more than instrumental improvisation, improvisation relies more heavily on aural skills. When students improvise vocally, they are drawing on a set of pre-existing vocal patterns, of tonal patterns. And if their internal collection of tonal patterns is not really secure, they're going to have somewhat limited success when it comes to improvising vocally. So what we're saying here is that students need a strong aural framework in terms of audiation and tonal patterns before they're ready to tackle improvisation. Next, I want to talk about some strategies for successful improvisation. The first thing is for you, the teacher, to model it. Students are much more likely to experience success in improvisation when they see their teacher model it. And here's why. When the teacher models improvisation, it does two things. Number one, uh, the teacher sets the example for what good improvisation is. Students and adults as well think that good improvisation means playing as fast as you can and just cramming as many notes into the phrase as you can fit. The teacher has the opportunity here to set the example of something that is simple and sophisticated. This can take some of the pressure off students since they know what a good improvisation will look like and sound like. The second reason it's helpful to have a teacher model is that the students see the teacher as a creative agent. When you participate in play-based activities like improvisation, you are setting the tone for a play-based process. Another strategy is to have students think the improvisation in their head. This goes back to improvisation being an aural skill primarily. 
Have students practice the phrase in their head before they're asked to actually replicate it physically. This helps them internalize how much time they have to make something up. And when we are dealing with improvisation in a structured way that's based on a meter or a phrase, this can be one of the more challenging things for students to figure out. The question is, when do I stop making something up? So if you can have them pat a steady beat while they inner hear the phrase, that gives them a chance to kind of internalize how much time they have to improvise. Next is using body percussion. I almost always have my students use body percussion before they improvise on instruments. And this is just a scaffolding step to help students internalize the spatial awareness that they're going to need when they move to an instrument. Jumping straight to instruments is certainly going to work well with certain instruments and certain students, but in general, this is a really helpful step to take before you get there. The next thing to think about is scaffolding from group practice to individual performance. When we improvise, I generally have the whole class try out an improvisation at once. This makes a cacophony of sound and it doesn't always sound very musical, but it does give students the chance to try out their improvisation physically in a safer space. Since everyone in the classroom is kind of worried about their own improvisation, it takes the pressure off. So giving lots of different opportunities to test drive musical ideas is a really important step. After we do a whole class run through, I can break it up from there. So I might have the whole class perform all together and then I might break it into half the class and then in groups of four and then in partners and then finally individuals. So every step of the performance process has been scaffolded. That gives students a different opportunity to test drive their musical ideas, and it also gives them six or seven different variations of their improvisation to try. The takeaway here is to find different ways to scaffold the process before you ask students to independently share their musical ideas. So we've talked about some prerequisites, we've talked about some strategies, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is about classroom culture. The amount of teacher-driven activities versus student-driven activities is going to impact how your students handle improvisation. And this is where my video last time about student musical choice comes in. If students are used to you making all of the musical decisions, like what to sing, what to play, what to read, how to read it, the form it's going to take, things like that, they might be a little uncomfortable when you ask them to take the reins in improvisation. If all they're ever asked to do is follow your directions to be a good musician, they might not have developed that creative muscle yet. However, if students are used to having creative ownership over the kinds of instruments to use, or the form that the song will take, or the expressive elements in the piece, they are going to be a lot more comfortable using the innovation and the creative thinking that they need for improvisation. So the takeaway here is to strive for a creative environment, a culture of creativity, instead of isolated creative activities. I love talking to teachers about their classrooms and specifically about improvisation. So if you have any tips that you would like to add to this list, I would love to hear from you. You can drop a comment below. You could shoot me an email, victoria at wemakethemusic.org, or you can find me on Instagram. I am at Victoria Bowler. Thank you so much for watching and happy teaching.